given all to us. We bring now this offering before you. It's just one way that we can demonstrate that we are followers of Jesus, that you are Lord of our lives. Take these gifts now, Lord. Receive them. As we lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. God, for our children, these young lives, would you capture their hearts even at an early age, that they will love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength for all of their days. We thank you for the privilege to gather today in this way. We think of many throughout the world that are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus, those behind the Iron Curtain, those that have to meet underground, and we pray for the persecuted church today. Believers all over that are literally giving their lives for their faith in this one event called the resurrection of Jesus. God, help us to be a church that is mindful of the nations and that we never get so focused on just America that we forget that you have a bride that is composed of every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. And so now we give, even for that cause, that the gospel would spread to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' precious and holy and powerful name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. If you did fill out that card, you can put that in the basket now. And children ages three years through fifth grade that want to go to the children's church time, you're dismissed at this time. If you're new to Living Hope, they go across to the children's building. We have a security team, so we keep, we have very high priority here, the security of our children, our property, and uh, great, great loving people that work with them. Wow, look at this great congregation of kids. This is awesome. This is really cool. All right, take out your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter 1. And by the way, on the screen is our church app. We encourage all of you to download the church app. It's got great resources. It also has the sermon notes today on there. So if you want to follow the fill in the blanks on the app versus the paper copy, either way, it's also a very easy, convenient way to give on a regular basis. And when you enter your profile info, if you put in your phone number, that enters you into our system where we do send out a text occasionally, just a real quick text, maybe a reminder about things. So we're trying to get better in the way we communicate, and so this is a great way. Have that app and download your profile, and we don't give that information out to anyone, so you can be assured that it's uh, highly secured. Second Peter chapter 1. Before we have our scripture reading, pray again for the message. Today we celebrate the greatest event in human history, if it occurred. The event that split B.C. and A.D., the event that skeptics and doubters have always focused on, and they should, did the resurrection of Jesus Christ really occur? And if it did, what are the ramifications for us? When Josh McDowell tried to disprove Christianity, he went after the resurrection, and he became a Christian. When Lee Strobel, an investigative crime journalist with the Chicago newspaper, tried to disprove Christianity, he went after the resurrection, and he became a Christian. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the bullseye of Christianity. If it occurred, if it's literally fact and history, then you are eternally accountable to the Jesus who did rise from the dead. For he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then he is a liar, for he claimed that he would. He's not the Son of God, and we are still dead in our sins. For in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, If Christ be not raised, then we are of most to be pitied. You are still dead in your sins. Basically, Christianity is a big joke if he didn't rise from the dead. It's April Fool's Day. Hope I didn't spoil anyone's joke that they're going to do after the service to those that are with you now too late. They're going to know now. But today is April Fool's Day. And either the resurrection is fact or it's foolishness. It's one or the other. There's no middle ground for this. If it is fact, then you and I have an accountability before the God who raised his son from the dead. If it's foolishness, then why are we meeting today? This is a big joke. It's all been made up. It's one or the other. And we're going to examine that today. When Josh McDowell studied the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, he was a, a law student, and he challenged a fellow Christian who made a comment about her faith. Oh, it's just a big joke. There's no intellectual credibility to the Christian faith. And she said, if you're so smart, why don't you disprove it? And he said, I will. For two years, he sat on that journey, 
And he came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ really was who he claimed to be, gave his heart and life to Christ, and one of his most astounding statements is this. Josh McDowell said, there is more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than that George Washington ever existed or was our first president. And I want us to examine this today from 2 Peter chapter 1. And before I read our passage, let me remind you who wrote this. <laughs> uh, this is the Peter who was a fisherman. Remember him? This is the Peter that would often stick his foot in his mouth. Remember him? This is the Peter who would often make bold statements about how he'll die for Jesus and then the next week he was denying that he even knew him. This is the Peter that lived with Jesus for three years heard his teachings, saw his acts of power, was there when he was flogged, whipped, beaten, ridiculed, rejected, nailed to a cross. By the way, did you know that the word excruciating comes from the word crucifixion? Excruciating pain. Crucifixion. Jesus died. Peter was there. And if he rose from the dead, this same Peter was also there. And he writes in 2 Peter 1, let's stand please in honor of God's word. 2 Peter 1, beginning at verse 16, and then we'll go to 1 Peter. 2 Peter 1, 16. This is the holy word of God. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention. Good phrase there. Everybody here, you would do well to pay attention. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing that, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That is a tremendous phrase describing the inspiration of Scripture. What he's writing about here and how he's describing the Old Testament being inspired is exactly what he was experiencing as he wrote this. <laughs> men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This amazing blend of humanity and deity, kind of like the Incarnation, where you have the humanity of the writer and the divinity of God inspiring his word through his Holy Spirit. Now just go to chapter 1 of the same book, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them, the promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, <laughs> having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1, this is the theme verse of our church. This is where we came up with the name for this church, is out of 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Father, we ask now that you'd anoint your word. I pray in the name of Jesus that the power of the Spirit would grant by your mercy salvation to the lost, healing to the hurting, the equipping of the saints, deliverance from the demonized, and that all who hear 
will be touched by your spirit, that your spirit and your word will come together in a mighty way to pierce hearts, divide even between soul and spirit, and transform our lives for your glory, that the nations may be impacted because of this message. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, point number one. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a myth. It's not some fairy tale. It's not some made-up story to start a new religion. The word myth means a, a mere story or fable or invention or fiction. It's not an April Fool's Day joke. Peter is saying here that this is not something we just made up. We didn't come and form a, an apostle pack and made up this story to start some new religion. How foolish that would be. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, Peter would have known firsthand that that was the case. The story that arose, and we learn this from the book of Matthew, it was that the disciples stole the body. The Sanhedrin and those that had sentenced Jesus to death actually paid people to make up the story that, that the disciples stole the body. Well, if, if, if Peter was a part of that group that stole the body, I guarantee you he wouldn't be writing what he wrote here, and I guarantee you he wouldn't have preached the sermon he preached at Pentecost. One strong evidence for the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead is the amazing transformation that occurred in the man who wrote this book. Peter went from being a coward to being a proclaimer of the gospel. He went from being fearful to being fearless. And he went from looking out for his own interests and his own self-preservation to living a life for the glory of Jesus Christ. This man's life was absolutely transformed on the day of Pentecost when he was filled with the Spirit, even when he witnessed the resurrected Jesus. Number two, if it's not a myth, then what is it? It's a historic event. It is an historic event. Christianity is the only religion that is based exclusively on one historical event, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago. He lived, he taught, he performed miracles. He gave sight to the blind. He gave new legs to the lame. He gave hearing to the deaf. He rose people from the dead. He fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. I've been to the Holy Land twice. I've seen the very sights recorded in the Gospels. Physical places confirm the truthfulness of the Bible and Jesus. Documents confirm it. Archaeology confirms it. And even non-Christian historians speak about it. For example, Josephus. Josephus was a... First century Jewish historian, not a Christ follower, by the way. And he wrote this. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many Greeks. Pilate had condemned him to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, by the way, you have to come up with some kind of a, an explanation for this massive group of people that began to follow Jesus and has resulted in us sitting in this room today. Tacitus was a second century Roman historian, not a believer, and he wrote about the great fire that occurred in Rome in 64 AD. Nero blamed Christians for this fire, and here's what he said about it. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from which the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. You say, well, these historians are reporting firsthand accounts, factual accounts of Jesus living, dying, and rising from the dead. Why were they not believers? Well, <laughs> because of one very simple but truthful thing. Becoming a believer in Jesus is not ultimately a problem here. It's a problem here. Now, some people have honest intellectual questions. We welcome those. We provide data for this even today, and, and I'm going to refer you to a great book by Josh McDowell called More Than a Carpenter. Every copy was taken after first service. I love it. We had to bring out about 20 more copies, and they're out there at a table 
just as you leave, just inside the room here on the free resource table. And it's basically a summary of Josh McDowell's findings. It's a Reader's Digest version because he wrote evidence that demands a verdict, which is this thick, more evidence that demands a verdict, which is this thick. He said most people aren't going to read all that, so I'll condense it into a Reader's Digest version, and then if they want more information, they can go to those two books. But clearly, the problem in becoming a Christian is usually not one of intellectualness, although there are legitimate intellectual questions some people have. But ultimately, when all the questions are answered and you're presented with the data, it ultimately boils down to an issue of your heart and your willingness or not thereof to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's why Tacitus didn't become a follower. That's why Josephus didn't become a follower, not because they didn't have evidence. It is an historical fact. Now, this third point to me is one of the most significant, and it was that which had a huge impact on my life, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. It's this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was witnessed by ordinary people. In verse 16 to 18 of 2 Peter 1, he talks about being an eyewitness. Now listen, the power of an eyewitness account. This had a profound impact on Lee Strobel, for he was an investigative crime journalist with the Chicago Tribune, and he knew the power of eyewitnesses. When he would investigate crime scenes, he would find out, what did you see? What did you observe? He would look and talk to and record what eyewitnesses said, because eyewitness accounts are very significant when it comes to investigating something's factuality. It's very hard to refute in a court of law, especially if you have multiple eyewitnesses testifying the same information. This is why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said that Jesus appeared to more than 500 eyewitnesses who are still alive at the time he wrote that. Very important. Not all those 500 were people who became followers. Again, the problem is not ultimately an intellectual one, it's a heart one. 500 eyewitnesses. And in chapter 2 of Acts, this is very significant, when Peter is proclaiming that first sermon after Pentecost, he appeals to the first-hand knowledge of the listeners about the resurrection. Now, it's one thing to report something that you've seen and you're telling a bunch of people none of which had observed it or seen it themselves. It's an entirely different thing when you preach something that you've seen that, that, they, have, that they have also seen. <laughs> so if, 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 there, if there's the ability to refute the evidence, it's right there in your audience. <laughs> if he didn't rise from the dead, all they had to do was say, Peter, you're lying. This is not true. The dead body's right over here. Y'all bring it out. Bring it out. And they parade the dead body of Jesus down the streets of Jerusalem. And Christianity would have died in her cradle. But that's not what happened. But look at this passage in Acts chapter 2. This Jesus, God raised up. He's proclaiming the gospel. He's proclaiming Jesus. And he says, of which we are all witnesses. <laughs> you guys saw it? <laughs> See, again, the problem's not the evidence with most people. The problem's the heart's unwillingness to yield. Then he does it again in Acts chapter 3. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. You saw him alive. We saw him alive. This is the Jesus that was proclaimed in the Old Testament. This is the Jesus who's the author of life. Boy, that's a good one to take, put in your theological pipe and smoke, it, isn't it? The, they're calling, you kill, how can you kill the author of life? <laughs> We're going to learn about that next week. Our next book study begins next week, the Gospel of John. Can't wait to preach it. John chapter 1 next week, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were created through Him, author of life. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Woo! The eternal existence of the Word who becomes flesh when He becomes a man. And He says, you killed the author of life, but God raised Him up and you saw it. You observed it. You know it. He appeals to the first-hand knowledge of the listeners. Furthermore, these eyewitnesses seal their testimony in martyrs' blood. Eleven of the twelve disciples martyred for their allegiance to the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth. James beheaded. Bartholomew flayed by a whip. Matthew speared. Philip hung on iron hooks upside down. 
Andrew crucified as an X. And Peter crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Now someone may die for, a no, for a, what they believe to be true. Muslim terrorists do it every week. They die for what they believe to be true. But people don't die for a known lie. And Peter was there to know whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. If he had not risen, he wouldn't be proclaiming this. And he certainly wouldn't have been willing to die a martyr's death. Nor would any of the others who died a martyr's death. And they didn't just all die in one big suicide pact, my friends. They died at different places, at different times, even on different continents over a period of time. Because they believed and they knew in their heart, this was fact. This was real. This was the Jesus who they saw die. They saw rise from the dead. And they were willing to die a martyr's death because they believed it and knew it right in their life and in their heart. Fourth, it was predicted years in advance. The other thing that Peter does here that's fascinating in verses 19 to 21 is he appeals to Old Testament prophecies. Very significant. Because what better way for God to prove his reality than to predict something years before it occurred and have it occur just like he predicted that gives substantiation to the Bible being a divine document and Jesus being the Son of God. Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah, the suffering servant. We looked at that Friday night, Isaiah 53, written 750 B.C. And he's writing primarily to a Jewish audience here who regarded the Old Testament very highly. They had a high regard for the Old Testament. They knew it to be the inspired word of God. Holy writings, that's what scripture means, holy writings. And so what he does here is he's saying, let me just present to you another piece of evidence. Not only were we eyewitnesses, not only have our lives been transformed, not only would I not be preaching this if it didn't happen, but this is written in your holy book. And that's why the book of Acts is filled with quotes of the Old Testament. Over and over when they preach Christ, they preach his resurrection and they, and they back it up with scriptures from the Old Testament. Here's two examples. In the, in the sermon in, in Acts chapter 2, he quotes from, from Isaiah 53. I'm sorry, this is not a sermon. This is the passage we looked at Friday night. In Isaiah 53, written in 750 B.C., it says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. To cause him to suffer. So Lord there is Father, him is Jesus. You have two members of the Trinity right there in Isaiah 53. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he died in your place. He took your sin upon himself. He was the sacrifice God required for us to be forgiven. He was the blood shed. He's the Passover lamb. In the Old Testament, they had to kill a perfect lamb, apply the blood over the doorpost, and the angel of death would pass over. And in 1 Corinthians, Jesus is called the Passover lamb. He is our Passover. His blood causes the angel of death and judgment to pass over us. That's what it means that he's a guilt offering and then it says he will see his offspring who's his offspring if you're in Christ today you're his offspring he saw you when he died on the cross that was the joy set before him and it to prolong his days there's a reference to the resurrection and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand then in Acts 2 when Peter's preaching this is the verse he quotes Psalm 16 verse 10 you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your holy one see corruption or decay. Psalm 16 was a prophecy that the Holy One would never see decay. He would rise from the dead. Now this is personally what had a big impact on my life when I was a, senior, a freshman here at the University of Georgia in 1979. I had received Christ my senior year in high school. I had begun to see God transform my life. I was raised in a strong Christian home but a more religious home where it was more ritualistic and I'd really never heard the true gospel in terms of the need to personally receive Christ in my senior year in high school I repented of my sins and I received Christ in my life and began to see God just do some amazing things giving me purpose and meaning and joy and power over things that I'd struggle with and so I, I knew what I believed but what I wasn't so solid in, and many of you maybe can relate to this today, it was awesome in, under the pavilion between services, this woman said, I could so relate to what you said about knowing what you believe, but not knowing why you believed it. She took one of those books today, and I mean, she's a strong believer. But she says, I've never had really the intellectual evidence and basis for faith in Jesus. I've never been able to defend it. I've never really known why I believe what I believe. 
Well, that was me. Because when I came to University of Georgia and began attending classes where professors started challenging Christianity and the Bible, I didn't have answers. And it, and it really kind of threw me off. Again, I knew what I believed, but I didn't know why I believed what I believed. See the difference? I couldn't defend it. I couldn't have said, well, here's some tangible, intellectual, historical, archaeological evidence for, for Jesus being the Son of God and the Bible being the Word of God. And so I began to read Josh McDowell and people like him. And all of a sudden, I went, man, there's evidence. There's historical validity to this. There's tangible evidence for Jesus being who he claimed to be. And the prophecies of the Old Testament were, were probably, for me, the thing that really did, did a number on my heart and mind. You see, Hebrews 11 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. See, a lot of people think faith's just hope, just kind of wishful thinking. Well, we just got to believe. You got to kind of try to convince yourself that something's true. When you know in your mind it's really not true, that's not faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. There is substance to our faith. It's another way of saying it. There's substance to our faith. There's evidence for the Bible being the Word of God. There's tangible evidence for God being real. Creation and all the things that, that the human body shows us. Uh, Rich did an amazing job in that class on Wednesday nights, giving tangible evidence for, for Christianity and refuting atheism. And there's evidence for Jesus, and we've seen some of it today, but I've only scratched the surface. There's so much more. Do you know why you believe? Well, I don't believe, David. Well, okay, that's the starting point. If you don't, if you don't even believe, if you, then, then why don't you? What, what evidence do you have that Jesus isn't who he claimed to be? See, the burden of proof's on you. Because not only in this room, but around the world today, there's a lot of living proof that Jesus is who he claimed to be. <laughs> there's this thing called Christianity. There's people that could, could give countless testimonies of their lives being transformed by the power of God. So if you say today, I don't believe, then the burden of proof is on you to, re, to, to prove that it doesn't exist. I love what Josh McDowell says. He says, I wish we had more people who tried to disprove Christianity. We'd have more Christians. <laughs> and what Rich did such a good job on Wednesday nights is he, he talked about ways in which the new atheism and other things like that really are not being intellectually honest with the evidence. And so this idea, these prophecies in the Old Testament are powerful when it comes to showing not only that Jesus is who he claimed to be, but that the Bible is the word of God. So if you're a believer today, you can stand with confidence in your faith in Jesus. And if you're a skeptic or you're unconvinced, study further, investigate, look into the evidence. Now the final point today is really the most important because it deals with how does the resurrection of Jesus impact us right here, right now, today, tomorrow, and the next day. Point number five, the resurrection offers us personal transformation. You and I need to be transformed. You and I need to be changed. You and I need purpose and hope. You and I need forgiveness. And it's offered in Jesus Christ in his resurrection. In 2 Peter 1, it talks about his divine power granting us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We're going to talk about that. Then in 1 Peter 1, it uses this phrase, born again. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Born again. Well, it actually comes from Jesus. Jesus. Well, we'll see this in our study of John. Jesus is the one who came up with the term. For in John chapter 3, the same chapter, by the way, that the most famous verse in all the Bible is, God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Well, earlier in John 3, he says, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What's it mean to be born again? Why are eggs used to symbolize Easter? Because born again means you're given new life. When you're born into this world physically, your spirit is dead due to sin. But when you receive Jesus in your life and you trust in Christ alone for your salvation, Ephesians 2 says your spirit goes from being dead to being alive. You're given a new life. Your spirit burst out of that eggshell, so to speak. You are given a fresh start. Isn't that good news? Good news that Jesus offers you a fresh start. Regardless of what you've done in the past, regardless of what you're doing in the present, He offers you forgiveness and a new life. That's why it's called the gospel, the good news. So the first thing we want to examine is the forgiveness of sins. I'm going to give you six things 
and, and there's so many others, but six aspects of personal transformation that this passage today that we've read speaks of. And the first is the forgiveness of sins. We're each dead in our sin, in desperate need of forgiveness. You owe God a huge debt. I want you to think of your relationship with God today like a spiritual bank account. <laughs> so look at this diagram. What you need to get to is acceptance before God. That would be like at the zero level, let's say. But in your spiritual account, in my spiritual account, there's an enormous deficit. You owe God a, an amount of spiritual money that you could never repay. You and I have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have lied, cheated, stolen. We've had impure thoughts. We've had impure motives. Things that we've done that we shouldn't. Things that we should have done that we didn't do. We've not loved Him with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We stand guilty as charged before a holy God. The Bible says that all have sinned come short of the perfection of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. You can name what those negatives stand for, but your spiritual account is in the red, and there's nothing you and I can do to get rid of that deficit. No amount of works, no amount of religion, no amount of good deeds can ever begin to erase that deficit. We are in a horrible state before Almighty God. There is only one thing that can pay our debt. <laughs> The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid our debt by dying on the cross. His blood shed for us is the only cleansing agent that can erase our sin debt. Did you hear that? His blood shed for us is the only cleansing remedy. So watch closely. Everybody watch real closely. Let's go back to the other one first. There's your deficit. There's my deficit. There is our sin and guilt before Almighty God. The moment you accept Jesus, this is what happens to it. It is wiped clean. It is removed. You go from being dead to being alive. You go from being a sinner to being a saint. He forgives you all your sins, past, present, and future. That's one of the things it means that you're born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He removes your debt and you have standing before God and acceptance before God. That's why it's called the good news. Amen. Come on, Jerry. All right. Number two, reconciliation with God. In other words, forgiveness of sins brings about reconciliation with God. You're now ex in acceptable standing with Him. Relationship is restored. Did you hear what I said? Relationship. Not religion. Not religion. Religion is, is a works-oriented, trying to be good enough for God, striving and struggling. This is a relationship. It's a relationship with God. He created you to be in relationship with Him. He doesn't want you to be religious. He wants a relationship. That's why the number one commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's relationship. When Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. And then what? He says, and I will dine with him and he with me. We will hang out. We will have a fellowship together. We will eat together. There is relationship. That's why the Bible refers to a new believer as a baby in Christ. As, a, as an infant longs for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow up in respect to salvation. And as you grow from that infant to being a toddler, to being an adolescent, to being an adult, all those are biblical ways of describing growth in Christ because it's all about relationship. And the biblical basis for this is all over Scripture. To as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. Galatians talks about referring to God as Abba, Father. He loves you with an indescribable love. He's passionate about you and wants you to be passionate about Him. He rejoices over you with shouts of joy, Zephaniah 3 and 17. He longs for intimacy with you. He says, let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. Let not a strong man boast of his strength, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. 
What God wants from us more than anything is that personal, intimate, growing knowledge and relationship with him. This is what it means to be born again. To receive the divine nature, 2 Peter. And so number three is this, purity before God. Purity before God. Now we go from God not just removing the debt and bringing us to zero, which would be enough, wouldn't it? Acceptance before God, forgiveness for past, present, and future sins, wouldn't that be enough? But in addition, He now moves us into the positive. He puts into our spiritual account what we did not have before. He erases the debt, brings us to equal standing, now deposits in our account billions of spiritual dollars, blessings, benefits. The biblical basis, 2 Corinthians 5.21, in this purity. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf that we might become what? The righteousness of God. That's what he says about you. He says that in Christ you're now in the righteousness of God. So now look at the diagram. He adds to your spiritual account all of these blessings, all of these benefits. It says that he has given you and I everything pertaining to life and godliness. Did you see that in the scriptures? He has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. In other words, you have, the moment you get saved, you have everything you need for life and godliness. Actually, just, just speak out some of the, th what are some of the things you need for life and godliness? Power. You get that the moment you're saved. Ephesians 1.13, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. What else do you need? Patience. Patience. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5. What else? Love, that's the fruit of the Spirit. You are loved with an everlasting love. The Bible says you love because He first loved you. Already have it. What else? Self-control. Self that comes through the power of the Spirit. You have that the moment you're saved. What else? Peace. You have that. The Bible says in God, Romans 5 verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. What else? I'm sorry? Joy. You have that because the one who gives joy comes to live inside of you. What else do you need for life and godliness? What's that? Boldness. That comes by the power of the Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Now I want you to look at the text here. He's given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. Okay, do you see that? 2 Peter 1 3. What's the next phrase? Through the knowledge of him who calls you. Through the knowledge of him who calls you. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So that through the promises you might become partakers of the divine nature. Let me show you how this works. The moment you got saved, God not only erased your debt, but he put into your spiritual account billions of spiritual dollars. And the secret to an abundant, victorious Christian life is knowing what you have in your spiritual bank account. <laughs> you know, the last time I went, I, I, I just heard the rumblings in, in, in the people at your bank, and, and, they're, and they're talking about how much is in your account. They can't believe it. All the people at the bank are like talking during their breaks, and they're going, have you seen so-and-so's account? It's just loaded. This guy, this gal, just got loads of resources in their account. And they go, well, well, when's the last time they came and made a withdrawal? Well, it's been a long time. It's, it's almost like they don't know it's there. And they're freaking out because of this. And it's just as if your spiritual bank account hasn't been tapped into like it should. Come on. And so the key is that every time you have a need, every time you have something for life and godliness that you need, you need to go and make some withdrawals. You see, some of you have been living as if you didn't have anything in your account. Others of you have been living as if you've got to work hard to put things in your account. It's already there. You already have it. You need to tap into it. You need to make some withdrawals. When you need power, Holy Spirit's there. When you need peace, He's there. When you need provision, He's there. When you need whatever you need, it's there. You need to start learning what you have in Jesus. And there are promises waiting to be claimed. Promises waiting to be claimed. Promises like John 3 and 16. 
God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes, you're not going to perish, you're going to have eternal life. Promises like 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Promises like Jeremiah 33. Call upon me and I will answer you. Show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Promises like Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Promises like Philippians 4 and 19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Promises like Romans 8 that says there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Promises like Romans 12 which says the moment you're saved you become a part of the body of Christ. Promises like 1 Corinthians 12 which says you've been given gifts, spiritual gifts, impartations of God so that you can serve Him and others effectively. Promises like 2 Corinthians 5 which says you are an ambassador as though God were entreating through you. Promises like Acts 1 and 8 which says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. Promise after promise that when you go to the account and start making those withdrawals, you begin to experience in the now what God gave you at the point of salvation. You've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now another huge piece we've already touched on it's found right in 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power. And we've already touched on this, but I'll just state it, power for living. Because it is hard to live for Jesus today. We battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. I call it the unholy trinity. Every day. It's tough. And if anybody says to you that, you know, the Christian life is easy, it's not. It's difficult. There are challenges. We have a flesh that still wants to go its own way. We live in a world that is increasingly anti-God. And on top of that, there is a real enemy, Satan and demons that are attacking, seeking to draw you away from God. That's why we need the body of Christ for support. That's why need, we need the word for truth and guidance. And it's why we need this. The very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if you've received Christ, he comes to indwell you and he wants to empower you. He wants to give you victory over temptation. He wants to give you victory over depression. He wants to give you victory and help in those relational issues. So beloved, here's the truth. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power that enabled Peter to go from being a coward to being a proclaimer of the gospel. It's the same power that gave healing to people in the gospels in the book of Acts. It's the same power that transforms Saul to Paul. It's the same power that gives addicts victory over their addictions. It's the same power that helps the abused heal on the inside and forgive their abuser. It's a supernatural power. It's the same power that heals a broken marriage. But it's also the same power that gives you strength if the relationship is not healed. It's the same power that can help someone say no to temptation. It's the same power that can motivate a normally lazy person to seek the Lord. <laughs> it's the same power that gives the believer authority over the demonic realm. It's the same power that can help you be as excited about Jesus tomorrow as you are today. Where do you need power? Where do you need power right now in your life? Where do you need help? Where right now is there a struggle? Is there a lack of peace or purpose or victory? Where, where in your life? Just identify it. If you're not a believer today, you need to receive Christ to have that power. If you are a, a follower of Jesus, if you've put your faith and trust in Christ, if you've received Christ in your life, you have this power within you. It's in your account. You have everything you need for life and godliness. There's nothing that you don't need for life and godliness if you're in Christ that you don't already have. Beloved, go to the bank and, and make some withdrawals. You say, well, I don't know what I have. Well, you need to learn what you have. That's why you need to be in the Word. That's why you need to read books like Victory Over the Darkness. A great book I'm just reading right now called Wired. Best book on, on identity in Christ I've ever read next to Victory Over the Darkness. Learning who you are in Christ. 
Some of you need to spend less time on social media and more time in the Word. You need to spend less time watching TV and more time learning who you are in Christ. You need to spend less time in entertainment and more time in knowing the God who created you because you have in your account everything you need for life and godliness. And the ability to tap into it comes from the second part of that verse. Through the knowledge of Him who called you. You need the knowledge in order to know what to tap into. And that's why it's so vital to be connected in a small group and with other believers. You, where you go and say, hey, help me learn what I need for this. Name the struggle. Name the, 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 the issue that you're, that you're having a hard time getting victory on. And you get another believer around you who knows that stuff better than you. And they say, well, I think this will help you here. And that's what iron sharpens iron means. Proverbs 27, 17. All right, number five. Inheritance from God. This is good. We're almost done. What is an inheritance? The Bible says here that you have received an inheritance. I like this. An inheritance is something you receive as a gift from someone when they put you in their will. Right? It's property, possessions, money, or whatever that you get if you're an heir. <laughs> well, the Bible says in Romans 8 and Gal in Galatians 3, believers are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. You see, usually you get the inheritance when the owner dies. Well, Jesus died for us and God put us into his inheritance. <laughs> and it has to do with what we acquire because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And look at 1 Peter 1, 4. Look at how it's described. It's imperishable. In other words, it won't end or die out. <laughs> it's undefiled. It won't be reduced in amount or quality. It, it, it's unfading. It stays as shiny and good as ever. And it's kept in heaven for you. Now, now listen carefully. Some of the inheritance you get now and some you get later. But it's all spiritually and legally yours the moment you get saved. Okay? Every bit of the inheritance was put in your account the moment you received Christ. Now, most of it, and I said in the first service, and I think I'll stick to this. I believe 94% of the inheritance you get now. And there's about 6% reserved for later, and we'll talk about that as we conclude today. But this inheritance is all this stuff. Let's go back to the diagrams, all the positives, if we can. All this stuff was put into your account the moment you got saved. And it's, it's part of that inheritance, and you get to tap into it. So what's some of it that you get now? Well, you get forgiveness, you get acceptance from God, you get the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you get to be a member of the body of Christ, you're adopted in the family of God, you're loved with an unconditional love, you, you have everything you need for life and godliness, you're given His Word, you're given His promises, that's what it means to, to walk in a living hope. And so you have this bucket of grace in your account and then there's this one area that's reserved for later last point is you get an eternal home in heaven so there's some of the inheritance it's, it's all reserved in heaven it's all yours now in legally and spiritually 94% of it you can experience here on earth and then there's a 6% reserved for later and part of that is this everlasting home in heaven and this is where 1 Corinthians 15 says because Christ rose from the dead you and I will get a resurrected body. All who have put their faith and trust in Christ receive a new body. And I'm telling you as I get older, 57 now and deal with more aches and pains in this body the more I look forward to that new body. <laughs> Can I hear an amen in the house? Amen. And that was about everybody over 40 probably. All you younger folks, you don't know what we're talking about yet, but you'll get there. But we'll get a new body because he rose to eternal life. There's an eternal home in heaven. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And we're going to see Jesus face to face. No longer will we know in part, we will know fully even as we are fully known. We'll be reunited with all those who've died in Christ. And we will dwell forever and ever in this place called heaven where there's no sin, sickness, Satan, or struggle. Did you hear what I said? We get to dwell forever with God in a place where there's no sin, sickness, Satan, or struggle. That is the future for those who receive salvation in Jesus. So the last diagram. He not only erases all the deficit. 
You're accepted by him. You're forgiven. You have righteousness. You have power for living. You have this inheritance for God. I mean, we could go, we could go to the sky with positives. The body of Christ for support the word for guidance and truth, and then ultimately that part of the inheritance that you don't get until you die or Jesus returns, but it's all yours the moment you receive Christ. Beloved, it's a gift. Do you know Jesus? Have you received Christ? See, there's probably three groups of people at least in this room today. Those that have not received Christ. You've never prayed and trusted in Christ alone for your salvation. You've not received him in your life. You've been going your own way. Maybe you're religious, but you've never yielded the control of your life to Christ. Second group is those that maybe have truly received Christ, but they're not living for Jesus now. You know there's areas of your life that displease God. You would be what the Bible calls a prodigal. You're a member of the family, but you've gone, ast you've gone astray. He calls you back. He calls you to return. And when you do, he's there with buckets of grace and love and mercy to forgive and restore you. And then there's a third category, those who really do love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. First category, you need to receive Christ. You need to repent of your sins and receive Christ today. And at that moment in time, you can be born again and you can receive this amazing inheritance. Second group, you need to turn and you need to re-surrender to God. You need to be the prodigal who comes to his senses and comes back to the Father. Third group, you just need to be encouraged today and just blessed and built up and say, I want to tap into more of what is mine in Christ. Let me just wrap it up with this. The resurrection power today available to you it's greater than any sin you have ever committed or are committing. Did you hear that? The resurrection power and the love of God is greater than any sin you have ever committed or you are committing. Don't let Satan tell you it can't be forgiven. He died for that. The resurrection power is greater than any sin done to you by another. It's greater than any emotional struggle, relational conflict, mental turmoil, depression, anxiety, spiritual struggle, loneliness, addiction, temptation, thorn in the flesh, whatever difficulty you're experiencing today, the resurrection power of Jesus is greater than that. And he offers you that today if you will but receive it. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you eternally for your amazing word, your amazing truth, your amazing reality. And God, I just pray right now that you will bring into this room, into these lives, the truth of what we have covered today. I challenge you right now, if you've never received Christ, to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I acknowledge that I have sinned and gone my own way. I thank you, Jesus, that you suffered and died and rose again from my sin. I receive you into my life. I surrender my life to you. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I put my trust in Christ alone for my salvation come into my life in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and change me from the inside out. If you're here and you do believe that you have received Christ at one point in your life, but you know that you have been living apart from His will, I encourage you to pray this prayer. God, I'm sorry for the way I've been living. And I thank you that you still love me and you died for me, Jesus. I turn. I really do want to turn, God. And from today forward, I want to get back to that relationship with you that I need. God, just cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And fill me with your Holy Spirit afresh. And for everybody, 
what area right now in your life do you need to tap into your inheritance? What aspect of His blessings and provision that is yours in Christ do you need to just grab hold of today? What area do you need to experience resurrection power? Whatever that area, just surrender it afresh to the Lord. Ask God to come into that room of your life, so to speak. And prepare your heart now to receive the bread and the juice. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. We're going to take the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to take the Lord's Supper in light of His resurrection. When Jesus ascended to heaven uh, and the disciples were filled with power by the Holy Spirit, they went around preaching the gospel. And the religious leaders of the day thought that, hey, we, we've gotten rid of this problem. But uh, people were following the disciples. They were believing the gospel. And uh, the Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes were not happy about that. And so they plotted to bring, uh, they brought the disciples in and plotted to kill them. And one of the Pharisees, a wise man whose name is Gamaliel, uh, had this to say. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, the teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished. And those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. We're talking about proofs of the resurrection this morning. Another proof of the resurrection is that you're here this morning. People don't follow dead prophets. People follow the risen Christ. And so you're part of that proof this morning. So as we take the Lord's Supper, let's do it in view of Jesus being alive and well and seated at the right hand of the Father as we speak. I'd like for the prayer team to gather along the side walls uh, and be ready to pray for those who would request it. Uh, you may come take the Lord's Supper at your leisure and please feel free to use these steps as an altar. Uh, and so, Let's celebrate and proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes.